On the Life of St. Martin of Tours by Sulpicius Severus Part 2 Chapter 9 High Esteem in Which Martin Was Held Nearly about the same time, Martin was called upon to undertake the episcopate of the church at Caesaradunum, Tours. But when he could not easily be drawn forth from his monastery, a certain Ruricius, one of the citizens, pretending that his wife was ill, and casting himself down at, on his knees, prevailed on him to go forth. Multitudes of the citizens having previously been posted by the road on which he traveled, he is thus under a kind of guard escorted to the city. An incredible number of people, not only from that town, but also from the neighboring cities, had in a wonderful manner assembled to give their votes. There was but one wish among all. There were the same prayers and there was the same fixed opinion to the effect that Martin was most worthy of the episcopate, and that the church would be happy with such a priest. A few persons, however, and among these some of the bishops, who had been summoned to appoint a chief priest, were impiously offering resistance, asserting, forsooth, that Martin's person was contemptible, that he was unworthy of the episcopate, that he was a man despicable in countenance, that his clothing was mean, and his hair disgusting. This madness of theirs was ridiculed by the people of sounder judgment, inasmuch as such objectors only proclaimed the illustrious character of the man, while they sought to slander him. Nor truly was it allowed them to do anything else than what the people, following the divine will, desired to be accomplished. Among the bishops, however, who had been present, a certain one of the name Defensor is said to have specially offered opposition, and on this account it was observed that he was at that time severely censured in the reading from the prophets. For when it so happened that the lector, whose duty it was to read in public that day, being blocked out by the people, failed to appear, the officials falling into confusion while they waited for him who never came, one of those standing by, laying hold of the Psalter, seized upon the first verse which presented itself to him. Now the psalm ran thus, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise, because of thine enemies, that thou might destroy the enemy and the avenger, defensor. On these words being read, a crowd was raised by the people, and the opposite party were confounded. It was believed that this psalm had been chosen by divine ordination, that Defensor, Avenger, might hear a testimony to his own work, because the praise of the Lord was perfected out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, in the case of Martin, while the enemy was at the same time both pointed out and destroyed. Chapter 10. Martin as Bishop of Tours And now, having entered on the Episcopal office, it is beyond my power fully to set forth how Martin distinguished himself in the discharge of its duties. For he remained with the utmost constancy the same as he had been before. There was the same humility in his heart and the same homeliness in his garments. Full alike of dignity and courtesy, he kept up the position of a bishop properly, yet in such a way as not to lay aside the objects and virtues of a monk. Accordingly, he made use for some time of the cell connected with the church, but afterwards, when he found it impossible to tolerate the disturbance caused by the numbers of those visiting it, he established a monastery for himself about two miles outside the city. This spot was so secret and retired that he enjoyed in it the solitude of a hermit. For on one side it was surrounded by a precipitous rock of a lofty mountain, while the river Loire had shut in the rest of the plain by a bay extending back for a little distance. And the place could only be approached by one path, and that a very narrow passage. Here then he possessed a cell constructed of wood. Many also of the brethren had in the same manner fashioned retreats for themselves, 
but most of them had formed these out of the rock of the overhanging mountain, hollowed into caves. There were altogether eighty disciples who were being disciplined after the example of the saintly master. No one there had anything which was called his own. All things were possessed in common. It was not allowed either to buy or to sell anything, as is the custom among most monks. No art was practiced there except that of transcribers, and even this was assigned to the brethren of younger years, while the elders spent their time in prayer. Rarely did any one of them go beyond the cell unless when they assembled at the place of prayer. They all took their food together after the hour of fasting was passed. No one used wine except when illness compelled them to do so. Most of them were clothed in garments of camel's hair. Any dress approaching to softness was there deemed criminal, and this must be thought the more remarkable because many among them were such as are deemed of noble rank. These, though far differently brought up, had forced themselves down to this degree of humility and patient endurance, and we have seen numbers of these afterwards made bishops. For what city or church would there be that would not desire to have its priests from among those in the monastery of Martin? Chapter 11 Martin Demolishes an Altar Consecrated to a Robber but let me proceed to a description of other excellences which Martin displayed as a bishop. There was, not far from the town, a place very close to the monastery which a false human opinion had consecrated on the supposition that some martyrs had been buried together there, for it was also believed that an altar had been placed there by former bishops. But Martin, not inclined to give a hasty belief to things uncertain, often asked from those who were his elders, whether among the priests or clerics, that the name of the martyr, or the time when he suffered, should be made known to him. He did so, he said, because he had great scruples on these points, inasmuch as no study tradition respecting them had come down from antiquity. Having therefore for a time kept away from the place, by no means wishing to lessen the religious veneration with which it was regarded, because he was as yet uncertain, let at the same time not lending his authority to the opinion of the multitude, lest a mere superstition should obtain a firmer footing, he one day went out to the place, taking a few brethren with him as companions. There, standing above the very sepulchre, Martin prayed to the Lord that he would reveal who the man in question was and what was his character or desert. Next, turning to the left-hand side, he sees, standing very near, a shade of a mean and cruel appearance. Martin commands him to tell his name and character. Upon this, the shade declares his name and confesses his guilt. He says that he had been a robber, and that he was beheaded on account of his crimes, that he had been honored simply by an error of the multitude, that he had nothing in common with the martyrs, since glory was their portion, while punishment exacted its penalties from him. Those who stood by heard, in a wonderful way, the voice of the speaker, but they beheld no person. Then Martin made known what he had seen, and ordered the altar which had been there to be removed, and thus he delivered the people from the error of that superstition. Chapter 12 Martin Causes the Bearers of a Dead Body to Stop Now it came to pass, some time after the above, that while Martin was going on a journey, he met the body of a certain heathen, which was being carried to the tomb with superstitious funeral rites. Perceiving from a distance the crowd that was approaching, and being ignorant as to what was going on, he stood still for a little while. For there was a distance of nearly half a mile between him and the crowd, so that it was difficult for him to discover what the spectacle he beheld really was. Nevertheless, because he saw that it was a rustic gathering, and, when the linen clothes spread over the body were blown about by the action of the wind, 
he believed that some profane rites of sacrifice were being performed. This thought occurred to him because it was the custom of the Gallic rustics in their wretched folly to carry about through the fields the images of demons veiled with a white covering. Lifting up, therefore, the sign of the cross opposite to them, he commanded the crowd not to move from the place where they were and to set down the burden. Upon this, the miserable creatures might have been seen at first to become stiff like rocks. Next, as they endeavored with every possible effort to move forward, but were not able to take a step farther, they began to whirl themselves about in the most ridiculous fashion, until, not able any longer to sustain the weight, they set down the dead body. Thunderstruck, and gazing in bewilderment at each other, as not knowing what had happened to them, they remained sunk in silent thought. But when the saintly man discovered that they were simply a band of peasants celebrating funeral rites, and not sacrifices to the gods, again raising his hand he gave them the power of going away and of lifting up the body. Thus he both compelled them to stand when he pleased and permitted them permitted them to depart when he thought good. Chapter 13 Martin Escapes from a Falling Pine Tree Again, when in a certain village he had demolished a very ancient temple and had set about cutting down a pine tree which stood close to the temple, the chief priest of that place and a crowd of other heathens began to oppose him. And these people, though under the influence of the Lord, had been quiet while the temple was being overthrown, could not, they could not patiently allow the tree to be cut down. Martin carefully instructed them that there was nothing sacred in the trunk of a tree, and urged them rather to honor God, whom he himself served. He added that there was a moral necessity why that tree should be cut down, because it had been dedicated to a demon. Then one of them, who was bolder than the others, says, If you have any trust in your God, whom you say you worship, we ourselves will cut down this tree, and be at your part to receive it when falling. For if, as you declare, your Lord is with you, you will escape all injury. Then Martin, courageously trusting in the Lord, promises that he would do what had been asked. Upon this, all that crowd of heathen agreed to the condition named, for they held the loss of their tree a small matter if they only got the enemy of their religion buried beneath its fall. Accordingly, since that pine tree was hanging over in one direction, so that there was no doubt to what side it would fall on being cut, Martin, having been bound, is, in accordance with the decision of these pagans, placed in that spot where, as no one doubted, the tree was about to fall. They began, therefore, to cut down their own tree with great glee and joyfulness, while there was at some distance a great multitude of wandering spectators. And now the pine tree began to totter and to threaten its own ruin by falling. The monks at a distance grew pale, and terrified by the danger coming ever nearer, had lost all hope and confidence, expecting only the death of Martin. But he, trusting in the Lord and waiting courageously, when now the falling pine had uttered its expiring groan while it was now falling, while it was just rushing upon him, simply holding up his hand against it, he put in its way the sign of salvation. Then indeed, after the manner of a top, spinning top, one might have thought it driven back. It swept round to the opposite side, to such a degree that it almost crushed the rustics, who had taken their places there in what was deemed a safe spot. Then truly, a shout being raised to heaven, the heathen were amazed by the miracle, while the monks wept for joy, and the name of Christ was in common extolled by all. The well-known result was that on that day salvation came to that region, for there was hardly one of that immense multitude of heathens who did not express a desire for the imposition of hands, and abandoning his impious errors made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus. 
certainly before the times of Martin, very few, nay, almost none in those regions, had received the name of Christ. But through his virtues and example, that name has prevailed to such an extent that now there is no place thereabouts which is not filled either with very crowded churches or monasteries. For wherever he destroyed heathen temples, there he used immediately to build either churches or monasteries. Chapter 14 Martin Destroys Heathen Temples and Altars Nor did he show less eminence about the same time in other transactions of a like kind. For having in a certain village set fire to a very ancient and celebrated temple, the circle of flames was carried by the action of the wind upon a house which was very close to, yea, connected with, the temple. When Martin perceived this, he climbed by rapid ascent to the roof of the house, presenting himself in front of the advancing flames. Then indeed might the fire have been seen thrust back in a wonderful manner against the force of the wind, so that there appeared a sort of conflict of the two elements fighting together. Thus, by the influence of Martin, the fire only acted in the place where it was ordered to do so. But in a village which was named Leprosum, when he too wished to overthrow a temple which had acquired great wealth through the superstitious ideas entertained of its sanctity, a multitude of the heathen resisted him to such a degree that he was driven back, not without bodily injury. He therefore withdrew to a place in the vicinity, and there for three days, clothed in a covering made of Cilician goat's hair, and ashes, fasting and praying the whole time, he besought the Lord that, as he, uh, he had not been able to overthrow that temple by human effort, divine power might be exerted to destroy it. Then two angels, with spears and shields, after the manner of heavenly warriors, suddenly presented themselves to him, saying that they were sent by the Lord to put to flight the rustic multitude and to furnish protection to Martin, lest while the temple was being destroyed any one should offer resistance. They told him therefore to return and complete the blessed work which he had begun. Accordingly, Martin returned to the village, and while the crowds of heathen looked on in perfect quiet as he raised the pagan temple even to the foundations, he also reduced all the altars and images to dust. At this sight the rustics, when they perceived that they had been so astounded and terrified by an intervention of the divine will, that they might not be found fighting against the bishop, almost all believed in the Lord Jesus. They then began to cry out openly and to confess that the God of Martin ought to be worshipped, and that the idols should be despised, which were not able to help them. Chapter 15 Martin offers his neck to an assassin. I shall also relate what took place in the village of the Aegui. When Martin was there overthrowing a temple, a multitude of rustic heathen rushed upon him in a frenzy of rage, and when one of them, bolder than the rest, made an attack on him with a drawn sword, Martin, throwing back his cloak, offered his bare neck to the assassin. Nor did the heathen delay to strike, but in the very act of lifting up his right arm, he fell to the ground on his back, and being overwhelmed by the fear of God, he entreated for pardon. Not unlike this was that other event which happened to Martin, that when a certain man had resolved to wound him with a knife as he was destroying some idols, at the very moment of fetching the blow, the weapon was struck out of his hands and disappeared. Very frequently, too, when the pagans were addressing him to the effect that he would not overthrow their temples, he so soothed and conciliated the minds of the heathen by his holy discourse that, the light of the truth having been revealed to them, they themselves overthrew their own temples. End of chapter 15